today our guest preacher is the Reverend Shelton Davis. Shelton is the founder of Serenity Pastoral Counseling, and she serves as our pastoral counselor here at First Methodist and also has an office at First United Methodist Church in Belmont. She's a licensed clinical mental health counselor with more than 12 years of experience and was the clinical director of Methodist Counseling Services. Shelton's also an ordained elder in the Western North Carolina Conference of the United Methodist Church. Her practice, Serenity Pastoral Counseling, specializes in helping clients that struggle with grief and loss, depression, anxiety, marriage issues, life transitions, and caregiver support. Reverend Davis has significant experience in the areas of mood disorders, adjustment disorders, premarital counseling, self-esteem improvement, and faith development. She completed her undergraduate degree at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, received a Master of Counseling degree from the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, and a Master of Divinity degree from Union Presbyterian Seminary in Richmond, Virginia. We are thrilled that she is in ministry with us and our preacher today. Will you join me in welcoming Reverend Shelton? morning how are y'all thank y'all so much for having me trying to get a little arranged here would you pray with me before we read our scripture dear lord may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight our rock and our redeemer amen our scripture this morning comes from Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, if you are following along, um, it is verses 38 through 42. Now, as they went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, Do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I appreciate that introduction. I didn't realize how much um, I was like, wow, I I think we probably should cut that back for the next two services. Y'all probably didn't need to know that much about me, but there's a little bit of of history in it that I think is probably helpful for the first story I want to tell you. Um, I I was a hospital chaplain first. Actually, my first real job was here at uh, Caremont. When I was 19, I did an internship at Presbyterian Hospital over in Charlotte. Um, in the chaplain's office, and I absolutely loved that job. Um, I, I, at that point, did not have any idea what I was going to do with this calling on my life, and as much as I thought that ministry was in it, I just didn't know that preaching was preaching every week was it. Um, and so I felt really moved when I was doing the job of chaplaincy. I felt really good at it. The Holy Spirit just just felt like it was inside me when I was doing my job. And I loved it so much, in fact, that I prayerfully decided this was what I was going to do with my life. Um, And for a a long time, I did. But I spent the next couple of years finishing college, um, preparing for seminary and ordination, and sort of pondering this beloved future career. I moved all the way to Richmond, as far away from family and friends and home as I had ever been. I moved into a seminary dorm, which is really just, it was just really like an, an old mansion that somebody had um, donated to, uh, to the seminary, and it was lovely, but it had no air conditioning, and I lived on the third floor with a 10-inch fan. Richmond's a hot place in the summer. It was as close to a monastic lifestyle as I've ever lived, and as close as I really ever want to be. Um, even with uh, the hardships of loneliness and, and heat, I was excited because that first semester I was going to take a pastoral care class and part of the requirement for that class was I was going to get to volunteer as a chaplain at a local hospital and I was itching to get back to what I knew I was already so good at you know I was like 22 and I knew I was great yeah my first day at the hospital I can't just I just can't tell you how excited I was I went in I talked to the head chaplain 
I got a quick tour and I got my patient list and I was just off and running, didn't need anything else, let's go. Went to the first room and I introduced myself and I was sure that we were gonna have an instant connection, that patient and me, and that we were gonna strike up this great spiritual conversation and I was gonna help change this person's whole world with just that one little conversation. And they would be set on the way to recovery through our work together with the Holy Spirit. You know what I heard? Crickets. The room was so quiet that I could practically hear the crickets outside the window. A little disappointed, I said my goodbyes, and I went on to the next room undeterred, ready to make a difference for somebody. I went in and started the same song and dance with the next patient, and you know what I heard? More crickets. By the third patient room, I was starting to feel a little deflated, but I gave it another try. Started to think the whole building was infested with a plague of crickets. <laughs> By the time I hit the fifth patient's room with the same results, I felt pretty defeated. I was almost in tears when I went back to that chaplain's office and told him I thought I knew what I was doing, and I must be doing it wrong, and that I had moved all this way, uprooted my whole life, for a career that just wasn't going to pan out because I couldn't do it right. In our scripture reading for today, Martha found herself doing a great deal when Jesus unexpectedly arrived at her house. And just like any good hostess to a crowd that pops by without warning, she was running around, likely cleaning up and preparing the food for an easy meal. Now remember, no microwave, no frozen burgers to, to throw on the grill. She's got to find a calf or a a goat or a lamb to, to kill, and then she's got to build a fire, put a spit out, and then start working on the rest of the food for at least probably 15 people if all the disciples, disciples were there. So she had to make sure there was water and wine, and then she had to figure out how to house all these folks because there's no Hampton Inn, right? She was busy for a good reason. She was doing all the right things that needed to be done for these people, but she's frustrated because Mary is literally just sitting there. I mean, she's just sitting there. The Martha and me gets pretty mad at Mary occasionally. <sighs> she's just sitting at his feet. She's just relaxing, and she's lapping up whatever sort of wise and poignant thing Jesus is saying, right? She's just enjoying it. She might even be joking or laughing with Jesus and the disciples. And when we read today's gospel lesson, we can hear Martha's anger and frustration seething. And she just wanted a little help with the load she was carrying. But she kind of comes off sounding like a petulant child tattling to a parent about a sibling's laziness. She had placed all of her hospitable energies into providing for the physical needs of her guests. Mary, alternately, had given herself over completely to enjoying Jesus' company. This, Jesus says, is the right way to be. This scripture reminds us of how difficult it can be to sit still and do nothing but listen, especially for those of us who see a need and like to provide for it. Guilty. For the, first, for the last two years, our world has slowed down a lot. We've been forced to stop doing nearly as much and just be. And while some folks report enjoying this slower pace, I am seeing a fairly significant increase in anxiety and depression in my office as folks run out of ways to distract themselves from their spiritual hunger and emotional struggles with doing. The scripture speaks to this modern issue in a really clear way. That all of our closet cleanouts and attempts to learn to make bread cannot. Be still and know that I am God. Enjoy the presence. Meditate on scripture. After daily prayers, sit and listen for the voice of God guiding you, comforting you, reassuring you. This is what we're asked to do, and it's a lot harder than it sounds. Let's face it, ladies. We've all been there at one time or another. We're having a dinner party, and we're going to try to make something that we would never in our wildest dreams make for our families on a Thursday. And we're getting totally frazzled. Don't, uh, my family's up in the back over there. I know my husband's over there laughing. We're getting frazzled. We're trying to keep the meal hot, but not burn. And we're trying to get it on the table looking like Julia Child, or at least Reed Drummond made it, right? And then we're sitting down to eat and realizing that we've hardly greeted the people that we're working so hard to feed and impress. Or on an average,
Average Tuesday uh, in an attempt to make sure that everyone in our households has a proper breakfast, the right soccer uniform for the game this afternoon, and has brushed their teeth, we snap at our loved ones, guilty, and start the whole family's day with an unkind word. Jesus' words to Martha are not an ancient commentary on entertaining properly, nor do they simply apply to how we treat guests when they come to call. They speak to us about how we should be for those we love. Listening, engaging, and caring. When I returned to the hospital chaplain's office in Richmond, I had tears in my eyes. My dream of being a chaplain was crashing down around me. Somehow, the skill that I felt I had possessed as a teenage intern has, had evaporated. I told the chaplain, Mike Johnston, my story. And when I had finished, he smiled. He began by telling me that everything was going to be okay. Then he managed to summarize in three sentences what I would be taught over the next four years in seminary and then clinical chaplaincy training. Chaplaincy, Mike said, is a ministry of presence. Ninety percent of this job is just showing up. Anything else you get from a visit is gravy. Being the Martha-minded individual that I tend to be, it took me years to fully understand these sage words, and some days I know I'm still working on them now as a well-intended pastoral counselor. What Mike meant was that it was more important to be with people, to simply show your love and support, than to say or do the perfect thing. I eventually figured out that people who are in pain, hurting because of a physical ailment or grieving some sort of loss, aren't just looking for the grand gestures that those who seek to help them attempt. Hurting people need to feel the loving presence of those who care for them. You see, it's, it's far easier to make a meal or a cake than it is to go to a person in pain and walk with them in their struggle. It's much more emotionally painless to mow a friend's yard for him than to sit in his living room and talk about the wife who's passed away. The idea that being with is more important than doing for is the message that Christ was trying to get across to Martha. Now, all of this is not to say that Martha's work was unimportant. I have a feeling that Jesus probably thanked her amply after he polished off his plate of lamb stew that evening. And as you well know, especially United Methodist women who are amongst us, feeding a grieving family is a lot more than just a Southern tradition. It's a sustaining ministry that allows those who are hurting in our midst to be fed spiritually as well as physically. We are Christ's hands when we feed the hungry. But I think there's a middle ground here. It's not just one or the other, where we can be Christ for one another. I'll give you an example of how someone in my church was Christ for me after our daughter was born more than 15 years ago. Kim brought a delicious meal to our house. She's a nutritionist, so it was ridiculously good. And she was on her way to a meeting, so she really had a good excuse to just book it on out of there. But she didn't leave quickly. Instead, as a mom of older kids, she engaged me about the wonders of new motherhood, and she listened as I told her both my joys and my fears. She related some of her own experiences and let me know that I was not alone in feeling somewhat daunted by the challenges that lay ahead. When she left, I knew that the stromboli in the oven would be gone long before my feeling of being cared for would be. ...of the church into homes and workplaces and schools. We get the opportunity to gently mold our children into Christ's image to listen to co-workers and fellow students, to smile at the frazzled person in front of us in the line at the supermarket, and listen to her tell of how she's covering for three of her co-workers who are out sick. Being with, in these examples, is a reflection of Mary's way of interacting with Jesus, focused on the import of a relationship with Christ. As modern Christians, we are Christ. Christ for everyone who comes here looking for him and hoping to see him on our faces or hear him on the live stream. For visitor or long-standing member, coming to church should always be an experience of the living Christ, 
not just a chance to learn or be inspired, but an opportunity to be spiritually refreshed by being with Christ, experiencing the Holy Spirit through both divine and mundane channels. That's what, that's what communion is. It is the divine and the mundane meeting. Sometimes it's okay to let the details wait and to bask in the presence, wisdom, comfort, and peace of the Holy One. Being Christ for those around us is intentional. It's a moment-by-moment -moment encounter with each person we love, with compassion and understanding. And each person must be defined as everyone we meet. On the telephone, in person, by text, by email, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, you name it. We have, that's our opportunity, no matter what the medium. For you see, we are not just Christ's or hand, we are not just Christ's hands and feet in this world. Christ is sitting at the right hand of God, waiting us for waiting for us to be Him for this world. Not just the kind of things that He did, the miracles He performed, or the faith He inspired. We are to be Christ's kindness and comfort, His hope, His compassion, His love, and His peace. Our challenge is to let Christ live down into the deepest dwelling places in our souls, to find our darkness and bring light to it, to infuse himself within our unique selves and to use us to help those who need him in this world. To be or not to be is not our question. How do you be?